So how come you're telling this story in installments, you'll ask? Well, it's about selling DVDs. It's all about selling tickets. Because in the Hollywood game of movie making, the ultimate god is box office. And the more you gross, the more they respect you. <laughs> you can be a director. All, you, all it takes is just to sell action. Oh, okay, let me hear you, though. Action. That's better. Louder. 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 Action. That's good. Yeah, that's very good. Kirk Ellis, my permanent co-writer for years and for some time VP of Omega, pushed me hard to sit down and write Nightmare at Noon, perhaps the most adventurous and logistically difficult movie I had ever attempted. A month later, I made the mistake to cast Wings Hauser in the lead, despite my unpleasant experience in the wind. Hauser, many, many years later, sent letters apologizing to all those that he had abused while he was also abusing various substances. Uh, I'm sorry about the mess. I'll clean it up, all right? However, what I went through shooting Nightmare was nothing less than the movie's title. One fine day, Wings had a fight with his brother in his motel room and punched him so hard that the poor guy's head went through the drywall. Wings got arrested and we had to bail him out to continue the shoot. We later learned that the fight was about Wings' cocaine addiction. But to balance the discomfort with Grace, we did have that ultimate gentleman, George Kennedy. This Rolls Royce of an actor and a true aristocrat of a man was the pillar of the set, despite the excruciating and constant pain of his knee as he had just come out of surgery. Not once did he utter a word of protest. Not once he refused to do physical stuff required for the part of Sheriff Hanks. Sure. Right. Let's try it once. Oh, okay. So I hit him this way, left try, 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 uh, try it the other way, the way you just showed it. Okay. Boom. Oh. Okay, and I'll just hold Frank. Great, George, welcome to the show. I'm delighted to be with you. Yeah? What, uh, what number of pictures is this for you? Do you have, do you, have you lost count? Well, lost count or stop, it, it's, it, I don't know, after about 50 pictures or so, it, and th I don't mean this to be important, it, 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 uh, it doesn't become as important as counting number six or seven or eight. I, I've done nine features. Uh, after a while, it is just like so many other things. It's just a statistic, and it, it's <laughs> relatively meaningless. Right. What, uh, what, what roles do you number among your favorites that you've done? Well, Cool Hand Luke, uh, the role of Dragline in Cool Hand Luke was, uh, meant a, a great deal to me. But my favorite movie that I've been in isn't Cool Hand Luke. I don't mean that I dislike it. I like it very much. But the movie I made with Cary Grant and Audrey Hepburn many years ago called Charade. Charade. Uh, it's a lovely film. I, I could see that every couple of years and, and really not get that tired of it. What, uh, what attracted you to this particular script? The, the nature of the business today um, is that this is what is selling. And any performer, if he's got any brains in his head at all, wants to be part of what the movie public is going to see. And this, the, the horror genre, is uh, very much uh, the apple of the public's eye. The public nowadays being, you know, pick or choose uh, a year or two of between the ages of 11 and 19 or something. Young marrieds don't go to the movies as much as they used to because it's too expensive a date. Older people stay home and watch television. So basically your movie audience, in my mind's eye, is, is between 11 and 19, and they are going to see this type of film. And when you combine that with a, a good script and uh, the way this company is working with good effects and everything, then you know you're going to be on the... Uh, on the part, uh, as part of a winning uh, team in the, in the box office. 
my God, that's all it counts. How does how does the law enforcement officer you're playing in this film differ from some of the ones you've done, like Blue Knight and uh, some of the other characters? Because you've played a rather long string of lawmen, I think. Yeah, yeah, I have. <laughs> the bad guys and good guys. And, and, and realistically, uh, to answer your question in what might seem like a peripheral way, the the bad guy, good guy concept doesn't mean as much as how well the writing is done. Um, somebody once said that Lawrence Olivier could read the phone book and make it sound better than somebody else reading Shakespeare. That's nonsense. Olivier could read the phone book and make it sound better than somebody else reading the phone book, but that's about all he could do with the phone book. So whether you're a bad guy or whether you're a good guy, and this, this law man versus other law men are played, it's pretty much in the way the thing is written and how the character is developed. And this character's developed pretty good. You know? so. This whole film is developed pretty good. How do you like the uh, the location here, shooting in Utah? Well, this is my first time in Moab, and I love Moab. I love not only scenically, it's a very, very pretty city, but the people here are just, they're so nice, and uh, we've had good food. I had in my mind's eye a Moab that must have existed in the days that John Ford was shooting here. A little uh, spot on the map or something, but Moab is certainly not a cosmopolitan or an urban city, but it is far bigger than a, you know, a gas station and a stop sign and a road. And it's a lovely city. And the God knows that the location is beautiful. Now you're working quite frequently. I mean, you, you came onto this location from another show, and you're going to another show in a couple of days. How do you, uh, how do you maintain? It? Or do you? It, well, it varies as. Uh, Part of the problem I've had with this uh, film is that um, my knee has been acting up, and you kind of grit your teeth and grin and bear it. But an actor's life isn't isn't all good things, isn't all bad things. It's you work when the work is there, and at other times you sit and wait for the phone to ring. Uh, in my case, I, I've had a pretty lucky string. Uh, I'm not discounting talent or any of that. I'm just saying there are times when you could be Olivier and sit and wait for the phone to ring. But there are other times when it just works. Well, it just so happens now I'm putting one, two, three, four, five, six pictures in a row together. Congratulations. Congratulations to you. This is a lovely film, and I'm glad to be part of it. I was also lucky to have Brian James of Blade Runner fame playing the repulsive albino villain. Unfortunately, that nice man and terrific actor died of a heart attack in August of 99. The albino. Uh... The only thing basically I can find about what's redeeming about the uh, albino is that any character that you portray, no matter how, what kind of a low life that you're playing in the movie, and I certainly have played them, uh, is that you can never patronize a character. You always have to play a character that you know that this character, no matter what he's doing, is doing the best that he can. Now, that's all he knows how to do. So he is justified in his own mind of whatever he's doing. I think the albino, uh, because he's working for a government, He's providing a service, and it's something that uh, he's uniquely qualified to do because, as you know, albinos do not have a very normal lifestyle. They basically live at night, and uh, they can't be out in the sun. They have problems with their skin as well as their eyes. In the film, I will be um, wearing pink eyes, which albinos don't have any pigmentation in their skin. So they live by night. Uh, and uh, I know that there's a village in Brazil that is all albinos. And this, the whole time clock of this town is turned around. Everything is open at night and closes in the daytime because they have to basically live at night. And the banks are open at night and the stores and so forth. And then in the daytime they sleep because it's very difficult. And one of the story points that happens here is this albino has to get on a horseback and get out in the daytime. And he's very protective of himself. And how he meets his demise in this film is quite interesting. <laughs> Running. Okay, shooting. And come up, come up, come up. I'll give you your top mark. Come up, come up, come up. Keep coming, keep coming, keep coming, and mark. Toxic poisoning. Well, there's two things that I identify with in this film as far as what's in the script. is toxic poisoning as far as uh, how that the governments, uh, unbeknownst to the population, have in the past and probably are in present day, experimenting with chemical warfare where the populace doesn't know about this is happening. And I know there have been isolated incidents where things like that have broken out and found out that there's been, all the way back to the Vietnam War when we were using Agent Orange and these things that have permanently damaged a lot of people that were involved in that war. And uh, 
that's really scary to me. I think it's a very important thing to be brought to light to the public, as well as uh, the toxicity of just our environment, how we are actually polluting ourselves, and uh, the things that we're creating through our technology because of this generation of modern man. That'll turn to your left and climb up over the rocks. There you go, keep that climb going. Keep her going, keep her going, looking good. I did have a problem with that uh, maybe five years ago. I got to a point where I had developed something what I called character hangover. It was after, uh, the first time I really experienced it where I was consciously aware of it was after Blade Runner. Because I had lived with Leon, who was the character I was playing in Blade Runner, for five months. Of course, I had my head shaved very close. And, uh, and uh, even though Leon wasn't a bad guy, it was just being that, and that attitude after, you know, if you play anything from a biker to whatever it is, there's a basic attitude of a bad guy is, I see, I want, I take. And if you don't like it, I'll kill you. So, you know, and if you uh, you smile when you tell somebody that either do it or else. Uh, but I found that I had that. That it started uh, carrying over a little bit. I didn't. I have to make sure that I leave this guy in the dressing room when I go home at night. So I had a problem with that before for a while, where I found that I would react to situations in life, off work, where all of a sudden this guy would come out because I'm not really a bad guy. <laughs> but. Uh, that can be a problem because after playing them for years, you can find that there are elements that are not in you that you get accustomed to portraying certain attitudes towards people. Because basically, what I do is I I recreate for people on film abnormal behavior and, uh, and psychotic behavior. And I do that because I can. <laughs> I'm good at it for some reason. I don't know why. But uh, yeah, I, but uh, I got over that. I went through a period with that, and I found that I was able to really let that thing go and uh, leave it at the office, so to speak. Yeah, their hair had to have the hair uh, stripped, it's called, having all the color taken out of it, and on the mustache and the eyebrows as well. And then we're fitted for contact lenses, soft contact lenses that are especially made by a doctor who deals with people that uh, use eyes in movies, and uh, he's a great technician. And uh, then we got the pink eyes for that, and the white makeup, and it's... Uh, it's very different. It's the first time I've had a role like this where I've had this kind of makeup, and it's, it's very interesting. It's an interesting look, and it's actually very uh, frightening. Not that albinos per se are frightening, but when you put an albino in a situation like this where he's in control of life and death over a lot of people, and he's pushing the button, then it's scary. Uh, the helicopters were, uh, it was a great uh, supporting actor yesterday to work with this, uh, especially because I had this sinister black jet helicopter behind me in this beautiful scene where in, uh, in the arches in the middle with the sky in the back I'm standing a couple of thousand feet above the desert wall and the wind's blowing and uh, I'm a little bit frightened but, <laughs> but I have glasses on so nobody can tell and uh, the helicopter's right behind me hitting its mark every time and flying off into the distance and we have this sky battle that follows where we have an incredible dogfight. I think a lot of people unless they watch uh, the making of films, I uh, have no idea how technical filmmaking really is, some of this stuff, and how, how precise it is. Uh, it's not just the acting, but everybody on the set, as well as the people that fly the helicopters on down, is just as important. I'm very fortunate that I am an actor, and I'm able to focus myself, and I am the person that actually gets on the screen, but uh, the other 150 people that are involved in this film, their effort is all as well, as equal as mine. In other words, everybody's the star of a film, because I couldn't get to do what I do and be on the film if everybody else wasn't putting in what they're doing from makeup and hair and wardrobe and the grips and all that. So it's, it's a group effort and it's wonderful to do. And the helicopters yesterday was, uh, I think we're going to be really excited when we see this dogfight.
My assistant director in this movie, Perry Husman, wanted badly to do a horse stunt. Here he is. Great. Kirk's getting it on film. This is a moment I'll never forget. Perry went on to other movies with me and also worked as an executive with Omega for some time. Today, he is a good producer of Witchblade fame. He shot guns around the horses and he they did. reacted fine. He did. So, yeah, we did it the other day also. Automatic. Is I'm gonna, you have uh, you're not going to, you, no, you're going to have the automatic, but you shoot singles. So it's just one, but it'll just, be that uh, machine gun. Yeah, it will be what you've what you used so far. Okay. Uh, okay. But it will be one shot on each. Boom, okay. boom, boom. Another comforting factor was the town of Moab itself in southeast Utah. A small town full of big hearts, wonderful, friendly people who'd let us torch Main Street and fly choppers in the National Park of Arches. As you understand, she's got the terrible headaches and it, it got excedrin like, written all over it. Hey. One, two, two, echo one. Big. Okay. Ready, Steve? Go. <coughs> Set. Go. Okay, Steve, got it. Go on, George. Got it. Fine. The chief of the local police worked with us as a firearms advisor and actor, seen here shooting and being shot. Not everyone left Moab in a car or plane. John Stewart, my wonderful stunt coordinator and stuntman, left it on a stretcher, badly wounded in a freak accident from a stunt he himself had designed and miscalculated. It was a hot, dry, slightly overcast day in a deserted town near Moab. In this scene here, John rides a bike over a ramp amidst explosives and supposedly crashes on the asphalt. John picked up a little more speed, the ramp was a few degrees higher, he missed the safety boxes and pads, and landed on the asphalt in reality, shattering his leg. took him to the local hospital and by chopper to Salt Lake, where he underwent surgery. That was his last stunt, 
He continued to work as a stunt coordinator and then director of action movies. But up to the time of his unfortunate injury, John had coached talent and stuntmen alike and performed his difficult duties with a smile on his face and always a kind word for his players. I don't think we need to let you put down yet. My car? Just two more. Two more, that's it. They want to move where? A little higher, a little higher. Little higher. Little higher. Little higher. Little higher. you're cautious and uh, suspicious of everything. All right, you bring him up to that one over there. Yeah! And we're cut. We reached traffic, guys. You couldn't go with him because he went the wrong way. He was supposed to go back, he went to the right. Yeah, what is this sorry. about? Who put this mark in? Sometimes a 10 second shot takes an hour to prepare. Blood pumps, hidden tubes, retractable knives, a lot of rehearsals and 60 precious production minutes, all for a stab on the hand. The on-screen result, however, justifies the time and pain. No pun intended here. Stay there. Okay? Unrealistic? I'm very unrealistic. Yes, I Why? Because... So the whole system will react violently. So when the knife goes into your hand, the first reaction is this. Ah! 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 Scream so you can feel it, okay. right? Method acting. <laughs> okay. Polaroid it. Print it all. Polaroid it. Anything else for you today, Charlie? <laughs> <laughs>
And there's always the case of the two second shot, which takes four cameras, 60 people, special effects experts, a lot of explosives, and two hours to prepare. It's called an SD-100. I put one of these in each corner of the window and blow the window about a half an inch before they hit the window. So it blows the glass and all they're doing is pushing the broken glass out. Because if they hit it, there's a good chance that they just bounce right off it because it's quarter inch temper. That's pretty tough shit. So. <laughs> Boom! Don't kill yourself, man. I'm not and cut. Good. Release. <laughs> Start a beautiful smile. Don't drop the. Uh, uh, uh. Don't go. Uh, uh. It's smile because it's ugly. Go. Uh, uh. Look at him. Drop the defenses. Just go mild. Give him that beautiful smile. Okay? Right. Okay. Go like this. And he talks. To you. All right, Sorry. let's do it. No problem. No, not your fault. You don't have to apologize. We all have to do retakes. Ah, it's me. Pa, Ma, has been worried sick about you. She's home waiting for you. That's right, Pa. Come on, let's go home. Come on. Come on, give me the gun. Okay, keep it going. One, two, three. And cut! Woo! Let's just get it on tape. <laughs> just get it on tape. Get it in relation to this car. Are you tightened up? Are you playing the same shit? Did you tighten or didn't you tighten up? Oh, I was tight, but they knocked me out. But I'm fine. Very nice, Mark. Hey, man, it's like going to the movies in the middle of the day. I loved everything. Okay. All right, guys. In Nightmare at Noon, we had turbocharged vans, horses, gunmen, Uzis, flamethrowers, exploding vehicles, corkscrew stunt cars.